So we're going to start off in this course with chapter one, which deals basically with matter to begin with, and then we'll move on to the periodic table and then some other related topics. Let me just go to the full screen here. So as you can see, and this is, I think, in your textbook, we're talking about basically using an, an example of how chemistry is very important, right? Chemistry is a study of matter, and we're going to talk about what matter is later on. But just to give you a short um, definition of matter, matter is basically anything that has mass and volume, pretty much anything that's material, right? And if you think about your everyday experiences as you go through your life, work, school, whatever, um, what you're going to see is that matter is very important because pretty much everything that you use in order to make your life easier, make your life more simple and all that, involves the use of material stuff or gadgets or instruments that are made up of material stuff, all right? So um, in this slide here, they talk about, um, well, the question is being asked, what are the different components in your portable electronic device made from? So that is basically um, leading you to an answer which will inevitably result in a discussion of material stuff, right? Um, how does the periodic table of elements guide us in the design of your, uh, your device? We're going to look at that later on. And here they talk about rocks and how do we isolate and purify metals. Again, as you can see, we're dealing with material stuff or matter. How ordinary sand is converted to silicon and the fundamental component of processor chips. Um, how is sand converted into glass and how can its structure be modified for crack resistant screens. And finally, what are the environmental implications of fabricating and recycling your portable electronic device? So basically what is being dealt with here in the last couple of lines right here is something that chemists all over are involved in. And that is basically transforming, um, transforming I should say, matter, you know, something that you might isolate from a natural source and how you can convert it into something that you'll find more useful or that can be a part of some component of some device that you can use, all right? So this illustrates the importance of chemistry as a discipline, right? Chemistry is involved in looking at how do we understand the composition of anything material and also the type of transformational changes that it can undergo. And a cell phone is one example of this. Everybody has a cell phone now. And basically, if you look at the components of the cell phone, basically you'll see that, you know, a lot of material stuff is involved in its manufacture and usage, all right? Um, and here's a discussion about how touchscreens work. I won't go into this right now um, because I want to get to this slide here, which is where we're going to begin our discussion of what chemistry is all about. So I think I mentioned before that chemistry is a study of matter. And matter, as I said before, is anything that occupies mass um, or has a mass and occupies space or has a volume, all right? And one simple example is shown here, that of water. And as you can see here, and you probably learned this from your previous um, science background in your elementary or middle school or even high school, where matter can exist in three main states or phases. That is no less true for water, as you can see here. So you can have water vapor, where water exists as a gas. You can, you can have water, which is existing in a liquid state, which we're more familiar with. And then you can have water in a solid state, which is be in the form of ice. All right? And this is pretty much true for any form of matter that exists um, in nature. You can have the matter existing in these different forms, right? So as stated before, matter can be classified by their phase or on another term that is used is state. And um, you can have liquids, gases, solids. And then there's a fourth category that you may or may not have heard of before known as plasmas. Plasmas are basically um, gaseous ions, and which means that you need to know what ions are, which I won't get into right now. We're going to talk about that later on, right? So all of these here basically belong under the heading of matter, and matter can be subdivided into these cat, um, categories. And down here is basically a description of the properties of the different forms of matter, all right? And this is something, again, you may have met before, and even if you have not met this before, you should know this from your everyday experience. 
um, as far as whether or not the substance will take on the shape of the container it's in. As you can see here, a solid will not take on the shape of the container it's in. All right. But the same is not true for liquids and gases. All right. So that's one difference between solids compared to the collection of liquids and gases for a particular substance. Um, now, when you get to this column where it says completely fill this container, well, we know that solids and liquids will not completely fill its container. But of course, a gas, because of its nature, will actually do that. So if you put a gas in a container, eventually the entire container will be filled. And that's because gas basically has this property of expansion um, to the limit of its container. All right. The same is not true for solids and liquids. And then we get to the third column here, which talks about whether or not a substance will have a definite volume. Now, as far as solids and liquids are concerned, that is definitely true, right? Um, they will have a definite volume. But as far as gases are concerned, because of what we said over here, gases does not have a definite volume because its volume is basically the volume of the container it's in. Right? So if you take the gas from one container into another container with a different volume, then the gas will assume the volume of the second container. Right, And then the final question or category here on to the extreme right, it says here, does the substance have a definite shape? Well, for solids, that would be definitely true. But for liquids and gases, that is not true. Right, Liquids and gases will basically take on the shape of the container that they're in. So this is basically a summary of the differences and similarities between the different states of matter, all right? Now, as far as plasmas are concerned, plasmas are gases. So basically, everything that we say here for gases will be true for plasmas, all right? So that's just something that you need to be aware of. Okay, so um, there is a video here which is talking about some simulations um, comparing the different states, how molecules and atoms behave, right? And um, some questions for us to answer here. It says, answer the following questions for solids, liquids, and gases. Provide an example to support each of your answers. Does the phase have a definite volume? Well, as we have learned before, if the phase have a definite volume, then more than likely it's a gas or liquid. Um, does the phase have a definite shape? We know the answer to that. That's a solid. Will the phase take the shape of the container? Well, we know that's um oh i think i answered the first question wrong in fact um as far as the definite volume is concerned that would be a solid and liquid i'm not sure what i said earlier but the answer for the a part is solid and liquid um going down to see will the phase take the shape of its container and the answer is that well the phase that will take the shape of the container would be a liquid or a gas and then as far as will the phase completely fill its container the answer of course would be that only the gaseous state of any substance will completely fill this container. And I'm quite sure it says here provide an example to support each of your answers. And I'm quite sure you'll be able to do that. All right. So I leave that for you to um, to do on your own. If you have any questions about that, well, please feel free to ask in class. OK. Um, now, when it comes to anything that is material, anything that has mass and volume, in addition to being classified according to state, they can be classified also according to its makeup or what we call the composition, right? So that is demonstrated in this flowchart right here. So matter is at the top right here. And as we said before, matter basically is anything that has mass and volume, right? Now, on the matter, you have two categories, right? You have pure substances and you have mixtures. Pure substances um, basically are substances that has um, a uniform fixed composition and we're going to talk about that later on mixtures on the other hand are basically um combination of two or more substances whose compositions are not fixed all right and we're going to talk about that too later on so let's focus for the time being on this side here so let's talk about pure substances as i said before pure substances have um fixed compositions right and there are some examples of pure substances we can talk about we have water, for example. If you take any sample of water, all right, and you break it down into its constituent elements, what you'll find is that water is made up of two elements. One is hydrogen, 
and the other is oxygen. Now, when it comes to that composition, what you'll find is that the composition or the makeup in terms of the percentages by mass of oxygen and hydrogen, what you'll find is that oxygen is about 89% of the composition of water and hydrogen is about 11%, right? So let me get my pen here, if I can find it, just to make a note here on the screen. Okay, so let me make sure this is working. Okay, so I mentioned the example of water. Um, the formula of water is H2O. We're going to talk about formulas later on. But what you'll find is that when you break down water into its constituent elements, um, oxygen would be, as I said before, 89% by mass, and hydrogen would be approximately 11%. These are approximate values, all right? So basically, any sample of water that you identify, it doesn't matter where you get it from. If you get it from your tap, or if you get it from the sea, or if you get it from rainfall, or if you, even if it's in outer space, what you'll find is that the breakdown in terms of the percentages of oxygen and water will be fixed, right? And that is true for every pure substance. The percent composition is fixed. Now, in some cases, the percent composition is 100%. So, for example, hydrogen by itself is 100% hydrogen, right? And um, chlorine, another example, is also 100% chlorine. Um, magnesium is 100% magnesium because in each of these cases, there's only one element present in these substances. So therefore, its composition is 100%. So that brings us now to the difference between what are known as elements and compounds, right? And basically, these are two subcategories of pure substances. So here's a definition of an element. An element will contain atoms of the same type, right? So we mentioned some examples of elements like hydrogen, chlorine, magnesium. Here's another example, silicon. And they all have 100% of that particular element by composition. On the other hand, compounds made up of two or more different types of atoms. For example, silicon dioxide. And we saw the example earlier of water. Now, I'm not sure what the composition of silicon dioxide is, but I can assure you that the composition will be fixed. In other words, the percentage of silicon will be of a certain value and the percent of oxygen present will be of another value and the total percentages will add up to 100%, all right? So that's basically um, the difference between elements and compounds. Elements contain one type of element or one type of atom present in that particular substance while compounds contain two or more different types of atoms, all right? Okay, so that's basically it as far as pure substances are concerned. On the right side of this particular diagram, we have mixtures, right? Now, as I said before, a mixture is basically a combination. In fact, let me write down, let me see if I can squeeze this here. It's a physical combination of two or more substances, all right? So we have mixtures, all right? And I can give you several examples of mixtures. For example, um, let me do the examples down here. So examples of mixtures would be, for example, oil and water, right? That would be a mixture. Another example, believe it or not, the air we breathe, right? The air we breathe is a mixture of gases. The main component of that mixture is nitrogen. If I remember correctly, nitrogen is about 79%. And then we have oxygen, which, if I remember correctly, is about 20%. And then we have some other gases um, that make up that mixture. Another example of a mixture, gasoline. Gasoline is a mixture of compounds known as hydrocarbons, which we're going to meet later on. So these are just three examples of mixtures that we can think of from our everyday experience, right? Now, under the category of mixtures, we have two subcategories. We have heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures, all right? 
So here are the definitions of heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures. Heterogeneous mixtures are mixtures that composition is, um, the, its composition varies throughout, all right? So of the examples that I have here, this here is a, an example of a, of a hetero, heterogeneous mixture. I'm sorry, heterogeneous mixture, right? And that's because the composition is not constant throughout. If you mix oil and water, and of course you can do this at home, if you add water to cooking oil, then what will happen is that you're going to get two layers, right? The oil will be at the top and the water will be at the bottom, right? So obviously that is not a homogeneous mixture, that's a heterogeneous mixture, all right? On the other hand, a homogeneous mixture is one that has a uniform composition throughout, all right? So one example that is given here is sugar dissolved in water. And the other example I'm going to point to are the ones that I mentioned earlier, these two right here. These two are examples of heterogeneous mixtures. All right. So the difference, just to recap, between the homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures is that in the case of heterogeneous mixtures, its composition is not uniform, right? There's some differentiation that one can detect between the different components of the mixture. On the other hand, in the case of homogeneous mixtures, its composition is uniform. In other words, you cannot physically tell the difference in that mixture between the different components, all right? So that's the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures, all right? Okay, um, let me... Uh, get out of, how do I get out of this, uh, uh, come on, come on, come on, okay, so here is a question which asks you to classify each of these as an element, a compound, or a mixture, and normally I would do this in class and I would expect students to respond, but since this is a video, I'm just going to go through each of these. Um, so, oh, the answers are actually provided, are they provided here? Oh, yes, they actually provided. Um, so basically, and I don't know why this happened, but basically, we're just going to look at each of these. So in the case of carbon dioxide, it's a compound because it's a mixture of two elements, carbon and oxygen, right? And later on, we're going to learn how to actually name compounds like carbon dioxide, which are made up of two elements. Then we have nickel. Nickel is an element, right? Because if you take a sample of nickel, you'll only find one type of atom present, all right? Cocaine is a compound because cocaine is basically a chemical combination of three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and if I remember correctly, nitrogen is also another component of cocaine. Water we met before, that's a compound. Fluorine, like nickel, is an element. Table salt is actually a compound because it's a mixture of two elements. One is sodium and the other is chlorine. And in fact, this here is a formula for table salt. It's also known as sodium chloride. Soap is a mixture of compounds known as um, esters. I'm just going to leave that. It's actually more complicated, but I'm just going to leave it at that. And then seawater, of course, is a mixture of different substances, salt, water, and other substances present, all right? So that's basically how we can classify matter according to whether or not they're element or compound or mixture, um, be it homogeneous or heterogeneous. And while I'm at it, let me just mention that in the case of seawater, this is a homogeneous mixture. Since we talked about the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous, and in the case of soap, this is a heterogeneous mixture. All right. Okay. So, let's see what's on the next slide. So, here is another exercise in classifying matter. And basically what they're asking for you to do is to put these different substances in their correct category according to the classifications that we saw before. So, your cell phone... Um, obviously, that would be a mixture of different components. In fact, I would go on to say that this is a heterogeneous mixture. 
all right? Aluminum foil, that would be an element because there's only one type of atom, the aluminum atom that is present. Red wine, that would be a homogeneous mixture. It's a mixture of alcohol and water and some other substances. So this would be a homogeneous mixture. Chlorine gas is an element. There's only one type of atom present. Stainless steel, um, that would be a mixture. And actually, to be more specific, that would be a homogeneous mixture. And then table salt, that would be a compound. I mentioned that before. And sugar is also a compound. All right? So those are the answers in terms of classifying these different materials. All right. Now, I'm going to stop here. The next video will deal with the periodic table. All right? Okay, so until next time.